Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back. We are on the last chapter, more or less, of this course. And it is all about vector functions. But today we're going to introduce parametric equations first and then get into vector functions because they're really two sides of the same coin. It's, uh, it's like parametric equations and vector functions are really the same thing, but you're just thinking about them differently. Kind of like back in, um, back when we were talking about lines, the equations of lines in three-dimensional space, we had like r of t, but we also had the parametric equations x of t, y of t, z of t. So it's pretty much the same thing, but now it's not just a straight line. It could be any space curve. At least that's what we call it. So 10.1 is called parametric curves. So 10.1. Call it parametric curves. And um, consider the unit circle. And the unit circle is circle of radius 1. around the origin. And what do we know? We already know that we can talk about the circle as x equals cosine of theta, y equals sine of theta, where theta ranges from 0 to 2 pi. So that is the description of this unit circle. Now, if theta equals 0, we're right here. If we use these equations here from polar coordinates, basically. If we use theta equals pi over 2, we're up here. If we use theta equals pi, we're over here. Down here we get theta equals 3 pi over 2. So as we change the value of theta, we end up at a different point on the circle going in this direction, counterclockwise. So as theta changes, or as theta, yeah, as theta changes from 0 to 2 pi, we move around the circle in a counterclockwise direction. And so we would call these the parametric equations of the circle. With parameter theta. So that is one way we can parameterize the circle. You could say x equals cosine of theta, y equals sine of theta. So that's actually something we've seen before, not too crazy. I think it's fairly easy to comprehend. Um, in general, definition, in general, 
if x and y are functions of a parameter t something like x equals f of t y equals g of t then these equations are called parametric equations they depend on a parameter t so we call them parametric equations and what do parametric equations do for us? Parametric equations allow us to graph things that are not functions. So parametric equations allow us to graph non-functions. Kind of like circles and ellipses and weird things that loop around on themselves. Something you couldn't describe with something like y equals f of x. So we can graph um, more interesting curves in two-dimensional and three-dimensional space. I just didn't put a z here. But uh, you could have a z equals h of t or something like that. And that would be your z component of your parametric equations. Um, most of the time we put a parameter between two values uh, a and b. So we say a less than or equal to t less than or equal to b. And then we define the point f of a comma g of a as the initial point on the curve and then the terminal point f of b comma g of b call that the terminal point so it's like where you start the curve and then where you end the curve and you could think of t as maybe time so at different times you're at different locations that's probably the most widely used application of parametric equations is to just let t be time and then um, your your position in space depends on that time so note for the circle we have two representations so note the circle has two representations the first one being x squared plus y squared equals 1 and that's the Cartesian equation and we often call that the static um, picture it's just the entire circle all at once. Every xy value that satisfies that equation is on the circle. So graph the entire circle all at once. I just call that the nice static picture. The second representation we already talked about, the parametric equations are x equals cosine of theta, y equals sine of theta. And that's uh, the parametric equations or the polar coordinate equations. So the parametric equations. 
And that's more of like the dynamic picture because as T changes, you get different locations on the circle. So if you were to plot that as T changes from zero to two pi, you would literally see a dot move around the circle counterclockwise. And depending on how quickly your plotting software works, it may be very fast, it may be very slow, but you would see a circle traced out by this one dot moving around in that circle. So that's kind of the difference between these two representations of the circle. You have the static Cartesian equation, but you could also have the dynamic parametric equations. And that's, like I said, that's like the, the go-to for parametric equations is to let t be time and x, y, and z be locations in space. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at, uh, let's look at an example. Example, uh, what is represented by I'm not sure why I'm having such an issue. What is represented by I'll give you some equations here, x equals, oh my goodness, not sure what just happened. Sensitivity just bumped up. I'm not even touching the screen here. Hmm, it's an issue. Try again. Hmm, x equals two cosine. That's just not gonna work. One sec. I gotta troubleshoot this really fast. Anybody got any tips? I'm not sure why it's being so sensitive. Like I'm not even touching the screen and it's like drawing. Okay, and we're back. I guess I'm not sure. I have no idea why I was doing that. I didn't do anything different. Now it's uh, now it's the other extreme. Now I'm writing and it won't write. Okay, A little technical glitch there. Hopefully it'll stop. What is represented by these parametric equations? Zero less than or equal to t less than two pi. X equals two cosine t, y equals three sine t. So we have these parametric equations. What is represented by these parametric equations? Well, probably the best thing to do is somehow eliminate the parameter. So eliminate the parameter. Well, if they were both a two, that would be pretty easy because I could just say x squared plus y squared equals two squared. But they're not both a two, they're two and three in front of sine and cosine, So, or from cosine and sine. So what we're gonna do is we're actually going to take, um, try to get rid of the two and the three by saying, okay, try x squared over two squared plus y squared 
over 3 squared. So that will be 4 cosine squared t over 4 plus 9 sine squared t over 9. So a little intuition there told me divide by that coefficient squared. Now um, that cancels, so we get cosine squared plus sine squared t equals 1. So actually we get the equation x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 equals 1, and we know that that is an ellipse equation. So that's the equation of an ellipse. So you can actually parameterize ellipse with uh, parametric equations, no problem. x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9. So the standard way to parameterize an ellipse is to say x equals a cosine theta and y equals b sine theta. So just make a note, standard way to parameterize an ellipse, maybe x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1, is to say x equals a cosine t, y equals b sine t, and t goes from 0 to 2 pi. So that's going to be the standard way to parameterize an ellipse. Um, another thing to note is the standard way to parameterize y equals f of x is usually the first thing you would try is just to let x equal t and then y equals f of t, and t ranges from a to b, because x was originally probably ranging from a to b, so then t is just x, so x, t is going to range from a to b as well. So just to parameterize a normal function, like a parabola or a cubic function or whatever, is probably just to let x equal t and y equals f of t at that point. So that's a standard approach. Um, not always the case. I mean, I'll give you an example here that's probably better to do um, something a little bit trickier. So, however, sometimes we use something more complicated. For example, uh, if we were trying to parameterize something like y equals 2x to the 2 thirds minus 5x to the 1 third plus 1, sure, you could let x equal t and then y equal f of t, but um, I would actually try to let x equal t cubed and then y would just equal 2t squared minus 5t plus 1. And that'd be a little bit prettier um, parameterization. So it kind of does simplify the function a little bit because you're substituting in x equals t cubed and that eliminates the third root in there. So that would be a different parameterization you could use just to make it look better. Hmm. Any questions so far?
All right, and uh, we've already talked about the equations of line and lines in three-dimensional space, so recall we had a vector function r of t equal to x0, y0, z0 plus t times abc. And from there we got parametric equations x equals x0 plus a times t, y equals y0 plus b times t, z equals z0 plus c times t. So we already talked about some parametric equations in this course uh, before now. Polar coordinates and then now we're seeing that back in chapter 12, we were already doing some of this stuff. So let's move on to vector functions, which are just the other side of this coin. Um, basically what we have right here on the left, that's a vector function versus its parametric equations, which we have on the right over here. So let's move on to chapter 13 to talk about vector functions and more detail. So 13.1 uh, is called vector valued functions. So vector valued functions definition. A vector valued function or vector function so vector value function or just a vector function is a rule that assigns a vector to each real number t in a set D. Um, the notation is f of, whoops, r of t equals f1 of t, f2 of t, fn of t, if it's an n-dimensional vector, so n r n. The set D is called the domain, and that is the set of all possible t values we can plug in and get an output for this function. So D is actually equal to the intersection of the domain of F1, domain of F2, intersected with the domain of F sub n. So it's like the intersection of all the domains of the individual component functions. So it's the intersection of the domains of all individual component functions. Every function has to be defined for you to be able to get a vector out. So basically we could say real number goes in vector comes out. So mo most commonly in this class at least, we're going to talk about um, three-dimensional vectors coming out. So for us, for the most part, we're going to have vector function r of t. The domain is some set of real numbers. 
the range for us is going to be three-dimensional space. So that's what we're doing for the most part. And so we could represent R of t as some function f times i hat plus some function g times j hat plus some function h times k hat. And that's going to be the most common way we represent our vectors. We're going to have three-dimensional vectors coming out in our range. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions? Let's pause for a second. Okay, look at an example to find the domain. So example, find the domain of R of t equals, let's give it in the, the bracket notation, t cubed square root of t plus 2 and sine t over t. So that's our vector function. We want to find its domain. So how do we find the domain of a vector function? Well, we already said that it's the intersection of the domains of all the individual functions. So we need to find the domain of each function. So we'll say f of t equals t cubed. And the domain of f, we know, is all real numbers. Because it's a polynomial. Uh, the domain of a polynomial, all real numbers, no problem. There's no restriction. g of t is going to be square root of t plus 2. And the domain of g, hmm, having an issue again. It's pretty weird. Sure, maybe my battery is going out of my stylus. That's my guess. I'm going to replace the battery. One second. Hmm. Okay. Maybe it'll work some a few more minutes. So the domain here, well we need t plus two to be greater than zero, greater or equal to zero. 
So that means we need t to be greater or equal to negative 2. So the domain of g is negative 2 to infinity. And the domain of h, well, h of t is sine of t over t. And the domain of h, well, what do we know? We know t cannot be equal to 0. So the domain of h is all real numbers without 0. So that's minus infinity to 0, not including 0 and then 0 to infinity. So then d is going to be the intersection of all these. So d sub f intersected with d sub g intersected with d sub h. So i got to figure out, OK, I've got to be larger than negative 2, but I can't be 0. So I'm going to be negative 2 to 0, not including 0, union 0 to infinity. And that's our domain. Just the intersection of all three of those. All three functions have to be defined. All right, definition. Now we start getting some calculus. The limit of a vector function. R of t is defined by taking the limits of each component function. So the limit as t goes to t0 R of t, by definition, is going to be the limit t goes to t0, f of t, comma, limit t goes to t0, g of t, comma, limit t goes to t0, h of t. So you just take the limit of each component to get the limit of the vector function. So that overall limit exists when each of the component function limits exists. So each limit must be defined, and then the limit of your vector function is defined. For example, Find the limit as t goes to 0 of r of t if r of t is equal to t cubed comma square root of t plus 2 comma sine t over t. So just the same function we had previously. Now I want to find the limit as t goes to 0. So this section, these problems, taking the limit, really just comes down to how good are you with single variable limits from calculus. So um, hopefully, it'll, hopefully it'll go pretty well. I don't think it'll be too bad. But uh, let's look at the limit as t goes to 0, t cubed. That's equal to 0 cubed, which is 0, since t cubed is continuous at 0. You can just plug it in. So that one's easy. 
the second one limit t goes to 0 square root of t plus 2 equals square root of 0 plus 2 which is square root of 2 again since square root of t plus 2 is continuous at 0 we can just plug it in so that's why we can just plug them in first two no problem the last one it's a little more tricky uh, either you remember the limit of sine t over t or you can use L'Hopital's rule to get there we'll use L'Hopital's so limit as t goes to 0 sine t over t I'll say by L'Hopital's of course you don't have to use L'Hopital's if you would just remember uh, this limit is 1 but if you don't um, we use L'Hopital's to get there so limit t goes to 0 derivative of sine is cosine derivative of t is 1 and now cosine is continuous so I can just plug it in so that's 1 over 1 which is 1 and we could again say since cosine of t is continuous yeah zero can just plug it in and so then that tells us the limit as t goes to zero r of t is equal to 0 square root of 2 comma 1 and that's our answer any questions so far Good stuff so far. The next thing, of course, is pretty much to define continuity once we have limits. So definition. Definition, a vector function. Um, R of t is continuous. at some point A in the domain D if the limit as t goes to A R of t equals R of A so it's the same definition we've always known the limit has to be the same as the function value at the point that you're considering in the domain and that's what it means to be continuous same idea we've always known and loved So oftentimes, because we're in three-dimensional space, these are called space curves. So note um, the curve traced out by R of t is often called a space curve. So you have some three-dimensional 
space here. And then there's some curve moving in three-dimensional space. It's like R of A, this is R of B, and so we're moving this direction along the curve. So these are often called space curves or even trajectories. Um, when we do projectile motion, we'll use these vector functions to talk about the trajectory of the projectile. So these are extremely useful, uh, very useful for like uh, rocket science, you know, like legit rocket science and physics and things like that. So extremely, extremely useful, uh, these vector functions. So any questions? Okay, just kind of pause for a minute, see if there are any questions, uh, maybe let people catch up if they need to. Just take one more second, see if anybody has any questions. Okay, we got one more example, we'll call it a day, example, find a vector function that represents the curve of intersection. of the cone z equals square root of x squared plus y squared and the plane z equals 1 plus y.
it's a solution. So we've got a cone and we've got a plane. The plane is kind of independent of the x-axis, so it's the same plane no matter what x value you're looking at. So we try to draw it, get a cone kind of like this, but then we have a plane kind of cutting through it at an angle, something like that, along the x direction basically. So this, let's see, we can, let's see, we can kind of arbitrarily choose what we want the parameter to be. So I'm just going to let x equal t. That's kind of an arbitrary choice. I could say y equals t, but I'm going to say let x equal t. And if we do that, then z equals z where they intersect. So z equals z at the point of intersection, so that tells us square root of t squared plus y squared equals 1 plus y. And let's square both sides so we can kind of try to solve for y. So we get t squared plus y squared equals 1 plus y squared, or sorry, 1 plus y quantity squared. And so then we get t squared plus y squared equals 1 plus 2y plus y squared. And the y squared on both sides can cancel. And so from there we can solve for y by saying t squared minus 1 equals 2y. And so take a 1 half on both sides and we get y. So y equals 1 half times t squared minus 1. So far, we've got x equals t and y equals 1 half t squared minus 1. The last thing is to get z in terms of t, so that's z equals square root of x squared plus y squared. And now in terms of t, both of those can be substituted in. That's going to be t squared plus 1 half times t squared minus 1 quantity squared. Actually, no, we shouldn't use this equation. We should use the z equals 1 plus y equation. So 1 plus y, and that's going to be 1 plus 1 half times t squared minus 1, which is 1 plus t squared over 2 minus 1 half, which is t squared over 2 plus 1 half. We can factor the 1 half back out and say this is 1 half times t squared plus 1. And so a set of parametric equations we could use to represent it are x equals t, y equals 1 half t squared minus 1, z equals 1 half t squared plus 1. So that's a set of parametric equations we could use. And from there, we could get the vector function r of t equals t i hat plus 1 half t squared minus 1 j hat plus 1 half t squared plus 1 k hat. And so that's our vector function. Probably is a good idea to figure out what are the bounds for this vector function, so the x values. So for what x values is this, or what t values is this true? Let's see. Problem didn't specifically ask for that, but it's probably not a bad idea to think about. For what values of t can I say this vector function is valid? Let's see, x is equal to t. So if we go back to this 
So this is pretty much the end, but if we go back to square root of x squared plus y squared equals 1 plus y, we get x squared plus y squared equals 1 plus 2y plus y squared. Get uh, x squared equals 1 plus 2y. So y equals x squared minus 1 over 2 is a parabola. So it's an infinite parabola. So x is actually anything, which means t is anything. So negative infinity less than t less than infinity. So this vector function, or this curve of intersection, is an infinite parabola. in 3D space. It's just at an angle in the three-dimensional space, but it would represent an infinite parabola. Questions? I'll link you to another one of those types of examples. It's uh, find the vector function for the curve of intersection, but it's a different uh, example, so it's got a slightly different approach. All right, so I think we'll call it a day. Um, I, I guess we could talk about the exam a little bit. Um, exam two is over. Uh, I think the, the scores are pretty good overall. We had some, uh, had some high scores, had some mid-range scores, some Bs. Um, we had a few Cs, some Ds, kind of like mid to high Ds, so that I would almost consider those passing anyway. Um, and then we had some lower scores. So the thing is, I want to remind you, I don't know if I've actually told you this or not yet, but I'm going to average the final with the lowest exam grade. So it kind of gives you a, a little bit of redemption. Like you can come back on the final, and if it's higher, uh, the final can basically become 40% and the lowest exam becomes 10% at that point. So it's really, a, I think it could really help um, if you put in the work for the final come back. It's cumulative, so it makes sense to do something like that, in my opinion. So just throwing that out there. Um, take it for what it is. And that's really just me trying to help you. So if there are no questions, we'll call it a day. You guys have a good one. I'll talk to you later. Have a good weekend.